Uh, now it looks like we're live. Okay, so we're, we're learning the process. We were just, Ali and I were just debating on who should intro the show, and Ali said I should since I've got a better grasp of the English language. Uh, do you speak another language, Ali? Uh, no. I, I used to be able to, like, understand a dialect of Indian, but I can't claim that I can speak another language. Um, That's hilarious. Well, English is my no, third no. language, and I have a better grasp of it. That's hilarious. So, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we are currently going live to my LinkedIn page and also my Facebook page. This is a project Ali and I wanted to do that is a passion project. That is something that is not about commercializing it. It's just something where we get to do something we both love, both enjoy, and it helps us grow. And growth being one of our biggest values, we wanted to do a podcast on books that we love, where we can kind of talk about the book and dive deeper into the book and, and see what the book is about and try to take some of the lessons and pull them apart and, and just stress test them, if you would. And, and the book we chose for this second episode that we're, we're doing is So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. So Ali, welcome to the second show you and I have ever done. I know, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. Awesome intro. See, your grasp of the English language worked and that was perfect. I know, man. Like, falls I think a, it falls apart <laughs> from here. <laughs> it can only go downhill. But uh, I think, um, as you said, man, this is just an exciting project. We did, what, the first episode, we did The Alchemist, and that was heaps of fun. And I think just from the fact that we both love reading, and one of the things that's always stuck out to me is that when you read a book, it's such a passive experience. You do it generally by yourself. You don't get to share the learnings with anyone and I think this is really cool that we get to bounce off those ideas and even doing this is our second book. I don't know if it was the same for you, but um, I've read this book before like you have, but I found so many new things that I never noticed before when you, when you think of it from the well, lens of having a chat about it. Yeah, I, I think having that goal of we're going to talk about it makes you read it in a different way. It, makes you, it almost makes you read it with the... Well, I read it with a few different mindsets. I, I read it mm. now knowing that we're going to talk about it. I read it going, what do I agree with? What do I disagree with? What do I mm. not understand? What can yeah. I distill? So then you just, it's a completely different experience. Yeah, 100%. And, and, <laughs> and I really wish we could be doing this in person, but I guess you're in lockdown in Melbourne. So, oh, well. Okay. Yeah, thanks for rubbing hopefully, that in. Yeah, hopefully it gets better too. <laughs> you just go enjoy going to cafes and restaurants while... We're trapped inside the yeah. house. That's all right. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of bunnings, but look, let's <laughs> let's get into this, right? So this, let's do it. I, I have to say that I I really like Cal Newport. I, I mm. love all of his books that he's he's written. Uh, what one of the the first time before I read this book before we dive into it, I remember this this shook me. This book in terms mm. of I used to be someone who who tells people you should follow your passion. Yeah. And this book, it kind of, you know, really attacks that point of view saying that's the wrong advice to give. You shouldn't be giving people this advice. And, and this is the image I had in my, my mind when I read this book is that people kept coming to me going, hey, Vin, um, there's a door over there. Should I, should I go through it? Is it safe? And I'm like, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Go through that door. And then not realizing through that door are monsters that, that just mold them to death. <laughs> that's, that's what it made me think when I read this book. I was like, I've been leading people through the path of destruction and I didn't know it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think you're bang on because this book probably questions a lot of the things that I definitely preach and believe in pretty strongly. So I think from the lens of questioning, yeah, some of those concepts, especially around passion and even things like lifestyle design, aligning with your values. It does question it, but I think it still also makes sense. And we'll dig into it, obviously, a little bit deeper. But I was super interested because I think this is probably a book out of all the ones that we're thinking of doing where I feel like we're going to have the biggest variety of opinions on this, uh, even the way that we philosophically approach life. Like I think you approach life from, uh, I'm going to be pretty kind here, but such a level of mastery and doing things at a very high level. Whereas I generally go the other way where it's go tinker and test, throw a couple of darts, do it relatively poorly 
and then see if you can build something from that space. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is exactly well, what Cal Newport says you shouldn't do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but wait, for context, I think an analogy that, that kind of defines our friendship quite, quite nicely is that you're the floor and I'm the ceiling, right? So, so what we normally say is Ali sets the floor so low that it makes me so uncomfortable and I set the, the ceiling so high that I often don't begin things. I mean, look, real example. The last time we did a podcast was what, a month and a half ago? And yeah. I, I didn't allow us to do another podcast until you bought a new podcast system. I bought a new yeah. podcast system. You had backdrop lights. I had backdrop lights. So I'm like, yeah. we're not doing another one until that works. Yeah. Chantel's like watching me order all this stuff. She's like, what are you getting? And I'm like, oh, well, Vince said we're only allowed to keep doing this if I <laughs> get to an equal standard. <laughs> She's like, that's good. You- it's good. It's good that you've got someone in your life that's holding you to a better standard. That was her response. She's in your camp. But let's not glorify what, like me being the ceiling, right? Because I think I... I I am the one that falls victim to analysis paralysis to the max. Like I can, I can tinker forever. You know, as, as people will come to know, I had an online course that I've created and completed about a year ago and never released it because it just wasn't good enough to me. Right. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, you know, like for you as well, you created an online course within a, a yeah. week and then released it. So, yeah, so that's... it's just, I think there's pros and cons to both. There's pros and cons yeah, to yeah. both. Yep. As we but always say, not, you end up in the middle. <laughs> yeah. The middle is where we should aim for. But look, let's let's not digress. Let's get into this. So awesome. Cal Newport is a professor of computer science at Georgetown and mm-hmm. he, just a brilliant mind, a uh, very young guy, which I I, I'm, I admire as someone who's so young that can can go to such deep levels of thinking and it's just amazing. The, the fact that he wrote this book before he pursued his career and the reason he wrote this book was because he wanted to have a career that he loved. So he wrote the book because he himself wanted to find a way to love his career moving forward. So that that was just, that that brought the book, like just the way the book ended. It, this is why I wrote the book because I wanted to love my work moving forward. I thought it was beautiful. Yeah, for sure. Well, when did you first read this book? I read this, oh man, I think I read this in my, early on in my entrepreneurial journey. So I think mm. maybe seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It feels that way because you? it looks like, it looks like this is a book that's had a pretty big impact on the way that you've gone about your kind of career and everything that you've done. Like as I was yeah. reading the book, I'm like, yeah, he definitely highlighted this bit and then practiced it at some point. I didn't know if it was coincidence or if this book did have an impact or not early on. Yeah. Um, I only read it, I think, for the first time about a year ago uh, okay. while I was in New Zealand. Yeah. Well, in, in regards with the content of this book, the, the book, I think the main idea of the book really talks about how following, giving the advice of following your passions, you should follow your passion. It's actually bad advice. So let's, why, why, don't, why don't we start there, right? That, I think that's mm-hmm. one of the first big ideas of the, the book is don't follow your passions. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous, right? Because there's such a huge culture of people saying, follow your passion, do what you love. Yeah. yeah. And to, to me off the bat, that it seems really interesting because the message is kind of like, don't follow your passions, but then if you keep, and we'll dig into this later as we go through this, but as he goes through it, he's like, you still should do something that you love and you care about, which is kind of the messaging behind follow your passions, but it needs more than just blindly going and following your passions. And that's what I really like about it at the higher level that, you know, the, the core concept is the way that I read it is that it's bad advice to tell people to go follow their passions, but you can still find what you love doing if you add it with a little bit more, which I think makes a lot of sense to everyone. Like most people that I know that have gone and just followed their passions without having any level of expertise or trying to learn that craft or trying to master that. Of course, that's probably not going to work into something meaningful. You know, like I could be passionate about learning the guitar, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to turn that into a career. Like there has to be some type of alignment. You know, I don't know. Is that what you what kind of got from it? Or because I don't well, completely agree that 
telling somebody to follow their passion is bad advice. I think it is good advice because it's aligning them closer to what they're about. I think it is bad advice. I think it's bad advice because, <laughs> again, the book talks about this, right? What it's mm. when when you say follow your passion, we're making the assumption that you have a passion that you just haven't discovered yet. Mm. And and I, I think that's that's so that that could be dangerous because that's just like saying there is someone out there for you. Your job is just to find them. And when, when, when mm. we believe that there is someone out there for us in terms of love and, and, you know, having our soulmate, when you believe there's someone out there for you, it, you have this expectation of, oh, when I find them, it's just going to be so beautiful and this is going to be perfect and everything's just going to fall into place. Yeah. I, 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 I just, that's, that's why the book shook me in that it just made me think, Maybe I, maybe I developed my passion. I developed my passion for magic. I developed it for speaking. I developed it for teaching. Maybe it wasn't always within me. Like that's, that's a really big point of discussion, mm -hmm. right? Because what you're mm -hmm. saying is there is something in you, but then I also do believe that you're born with something as well. Like, yeah. like you know, how every child, we both have kids. Every child is yeah. different. Xander right now, mm -hmm. my baby boy, Dude, he loves the outdoors. He loves going mm. for hikes. He loves going for what he loves the outdoors. Yeah. Being his father, don't love the outdoors. Don't love hiking. <laughs> so, so again, I, I do think children are born with something. We're all born yeah. with something. We've got, but then yeah, I also we've got think, innate areas. Yeah. 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 So we've, so we've got yeah. innate areas of interest. Mm. Yeah. It's a good point because I, I was thinking about it with, the lens off the future golf story, right? Like that was completely driven by passion. It's, uh, I wanted to be in the golf space. I'd never been in that industry. And I probably went nearly against Cal's advice <clears throat> where I just blindly walked through the door of passion. But I knew that it wasn't going to come in the form of becoming, say, a professional golfer. You know, like in an ideal world, that would have been it. You would, I would have started playing golf when I was five or six years old, worked my way up. And if everything went well, would have potentially, that would have been the dream, like becoming a professional golfer. That was never going to happen when you pick up the sport at 21 and being just a very average athlete and not being good at the game of golf was probably going to hurt that. But it was, how can you nearly substitute something similar with alignment with the passion? But that's where I think there's a difference between blindly walking through the door of passion, but then maybe potentially walking through the door of passion and then figuring out. And, and I love it. Like, I don't know if we're skipping too far ahead here, but Cal talks yeah. about the concept of little bets. Mm. And that was something that really spoke to me because that's nearly the way that I think you can kind of walk through the door of passion. Cause if you take enough of those little bets and well, little shots, well, let's Let's take a step back for one second, right? Before we get mm. to little bits. I think what's important to clarify here as well is that, mm. so, so Cal is going to hold, his whole thesis is that when you get good at something, so, so first build skill in something, because if you build skill in something, then you're more likely to enjoy it. Because yeah. when you build skill in something, more people will value it. And then when more mm. people value it, then you will enjoy it more because you get more fulfillment from the work you do. But then also when you're good at something, you enjoy the process more because you're good at it. So there's, there, there's, there's multiple reasons why we should strive for mastery. And, and here's kind of whole analysis of it is that, so when you get so good that they can't ignore you, the quote from Steve Martin, when you become so good, people can't ignore you. That's when you become passionate about something. Mm. And to him, it was such a kind of nice, I think it was, it was such a great theory in his mind as well, because this means that there are so many people right now suffering in their jobs, not enjoying what they do. And they would jump between jobs. They'll go, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I did this job for six months. I'm not passionate about it. I should just go to another job. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the next job and then they go, oh, I've been here for two years. I'm not passionate about it. I should move to the next job. And that is talking to the point of that's chronic. That, that problem is chronic. It's and that leads you to this kind of life of misery of going, oh, I'm never going to find what I'm passionate about. Because again, they believe that there's something in me mm. that I haven't discovered that once I find it, I'll know. Whereas Cal's thought is, no, no, no. You don't like the job you're in right now. Maybe because you're not so good 
people can't ignore you. Maybe because you're not mm -hmm. amazing at it. That's why you don't love it, which yeah. gives hope, I think, to, to so many people who are, are not enjoying their jobs. Maybe it's not about finding the next career. Maybe it's about getting exceptionally good at it and then you'll find the love for it. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good point. And he uses two real, uh, two awesome examples where I think he talks about one of the people that he spoke to that was a yoga teacher, uh, yeah. went from the corporate world into yoga. And the example was, well, that that's a pretty common shift, right? A lot of people, they get into yoga or meditation, they do a six week or a six month course, and then they go into a pretty competitive landscape of trying to uh, set up as an authority in a space where they only have six weeks or six months off repetition. And it's really hard for them to com uh, compete and establish themselves. And I think the other example he uses is uh, people in metropolitan cities that go out and buy a farm and then <laughs> go down that process. And a lot of them don't work because they haven't, well, they obviously don't know how to operate a farm. So, so it's this thing around combining where you do have, yeah, some sort of skill set. It, it makes sense. Like, I think that's the bit that, definitely sticks out is that if you are going to go down the passion or the mission or the purpose route, <laughs> make sure you've got something that's substantial backing you behind it or, or at least some sort of skill set, right? And uh, that, that definitely stood out for me in, well, in the book. Well, well, I think a really, a really powerful talking point here is, so, so, what, he is, so what he is saying is you can't be passionate about something that you're not good at. And I, I, I know I thought that that made me think a lot because <laughs> it just made me go, am I passionate about something that I'm not good at? I'm like, yeah, there is. I, I love building stuff. Yeah. Like I like, I, I actually like handyman stuff, but I'm not a handyman. I'm, I'm more likely an inept man, but I, I enjoy the process of doing it. Like I, I'm, I'm passionate about it. Right. Yeah. So to me, I don't know. It's like, you like again? I, I okay. So Xander, he 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 loves painting, and I, when I sit down and I paint with Xander, we're painting nothing. <laughs> it's just it's just lines and scribbles and mm. and different mm. colors. And I'm like you know, I'm kind. I I enjoy it. So it's it's yeah. almost saying you can't enjoy something you're bad at, which I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're- uh, no, okay, I, okay, I, okay, 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 hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry to butt in, but I, I need to butt in. It, I think you can't enjoy something in the long run that is like enjoyment and passion is not sustainable if you're not good at it. You can momentarily enjoy something if you suck at it, right? Like it's possible. I can momentarily enjoy building. Oh, I love drilling, 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 <laughs> drilling. It's fun. But if I had to sustain building for the next five years and I sucked at it the entire time, not possible. You haven't played golf. With golf, right. pe people will play golf like 40 years and not improve, not one iota, and they will still oh, go play three terrible. times a week. Yeah. It's like, so I, I, I don't know if I agree with, I think, I think you can enjoy mm. something even if, see, this is where we're a little bit different though, because yeah. I think you personally, you probably won't be able to enjoy it unless you're I, amazing at it because you're generally pretty good at most things that you do. And yeah, I'm not making you say this because I know you as a mate, like you pick up things super quick and you get pretty good at them relatively quickly. Whereas if I'm doing something, it's going to take me like six years to improve like one point. And I'll just keep doing it sporadically <laughs> from here or there. Like, I'll, like I'll, I've got a chess board behind me. I don't know if you can see it there. And like, I've been picking up chess on and off for three years. And you keep improving and I enjoy it. But if yeah. I've just done like the Vin style where probably hire one of a really good coach, go into chess camp, uh, okay. play chess with my mates all the time. Like obviously I'd get better. I'd probably I'd have enjoyed it more, but you know, there's, I think there's a different way, but I'd still count it as a bit of a passion. Well, well, okay. But we have to keep the context here really important. The, the context <laughs> of this entire book is that you're, you're finding work that you're passionate about, right? That's true. So sure. That's true. Work's like, different. You, what what, yeah. what you're talking about there is a hobby, right? You, yeah. Because like, let, let's say that you were in a job <laughs> for 40 years and you were never good at it. No way are you happy. Like, there's just no way. 
Because yeah, but what? what so I think, what I, I if think you the just context love is friend? really important. <laughs> <laughs> what if you just love hanging out at that place with the people, or like they have a really good I, catering? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think you're fighting for 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 something that that is it's a losing battle, brother. But look, what 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 I do think is that with the context of work that you're passionate about, where yeah. this is what you do as work. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I think there isn't. I think you can start work. You can start something and go. Oh yeah, this isn't too bad. I I, I yeah. I'm I think I'm passionate about it. But if you mm. don't build skill while you work, then mm. you cannot remain passionate about it, and passion kind of fades. Yeah. An example to think of, which I, I have no idea whether this is going to go to a good place or not, but <laughs> think about love. Think about yeah. how we how we met the loves of our lives, right? Like, you know, yeah. you met Chantel, I, I met Pei Wen. Yep. Each other. Do you, okay. This, this is kind of you and me, for example, you know, we love each other. So, so let me ask you this. Okay. So let's use us as an example. So we don't accidentally offend our wives live on air and then we pay the repercussions later. But look, yeah. do you... <laughs> this is going to sound so weird. Do you love me more now as compared to when we first met? Or did you love me more when we first met? Yeah, well, obviously you deepen the relationship. Right. Over time. So, so it's very hard to say <laughs> Say that it yeah, changes. It will, I, I would love to no, get Chantel and Pei Wen in here and ask them this question about us. <laughs> we can do, <laughs> we can do this. We can do this as an episode where we bring him in, right? I've got two yeah. microphones. <laughs> the funny thing is I made you buy two microphones, not one. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. That's how much of a crazy person I am. But look, no, no okay. No, well, let awesome. me answer it. Yeah. I love you so much more as a brother and as a human being now than when I first met you. Hands down, 100%. Because as we started to build a deeper relationship, I started to care more about you. When I started to mm. learn more about you, I started to care more about you. I think... The idea of going through life and then just, oh, discovering your passion and, oh, that's it. This is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I think it's flawed because when you look at it par parallel with relationships, mm. when you go through life thinking you're going to find Prince Charming or the beautiful mm. princess hiding in a tower, you kind of go through life, no one's ever good enough. No job is ever good enough. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. like, I definitely love my wife now more than I loved mm. her when I first met her because- it, like, the, like a relationship is kind of a skill as well, you know, in a sense, because you build, oh, that's what you love. Oh, that's how I need to, to kind of shape. That's how we need to compromise. Oh, yeah. and then now we love each other more. Yeah. It's so, is it a bit, because I think love is deep, right? And for things to get deeper, they need more time. They need more immersion. They need more consistency. Whereas, Maybe passion is more just the attraction, which also exists a lot of the time at the starting point in the love process, right? If I think back to Chantelle and I meeting and say if you had like a passion graph on one side and then a love graph on the other side, I think a lot of relationships generally at the start start super high on the passion side. And then yeah. the reality is, is like as love increases, passion, I think naturally also kind of decreases and you meet in the middle, right? Like if you think about most relationships that are 10, 20 years in, mm. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there'd be many where the passion level has stayed exactly the same yeah. as what it was from day one all the way to day 20. And I think that's also mm. the same, even if you are doing a vocation that you love or a job that mm. you love, like last six years, you're the same. You've been in an area where you, you would probably have to say that we're doing something pretty close to what we're passionate about. But yeah. that doesn't mean that my job as CEO or your job as speaker, communication teacher, doesn't mean that it has bits that suck, that are super mm. difficult and that are completely unrelated to the vocation that we're passionate about. Right? Mm. Like I know there's times sitting there in this journey with, say, Future Golf where the passion for golf it, it it's nearly subsided at times because you're so deeply into the other stuff that's completely unrelated, but probably more aligned to your skill set, which is like making decisions on staffing and strategy and structure and um, decisions and and all the tough things that come with it. You know, like like that that's there's something in that as well where where passion's probably a little bit too simplistic, but it is something that maybe 
gets people their first foot into the door. Right. It's like, you know, again, in, in relation to relationship, it's like lust, right? Is that initial lust, lust and lust kind of yeah. starts to settle and then love starts to, yeah. to, starts to take over. Well, yeah. well okay. I, I think it's important that we define, well, what is passion? I'm going to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna, I'm just going to quickly Google like what the Google definition is to passion. Well, but while I well, do before this- you Google, what, what, Before what you, you Google it, it, yeah, yeah. Like I think we should okay, go okay, okay. Our, our definitions okay. before we go to, to To me- Okay, okay. I haven't Googled it yet. To, I'm just typing Google into the thing. The thing that comes to my mind with passion, it's a magnet. It, it's something that draws me towards something. It's like an inkling, okay. uh, mm. a level of excitement. You know, it's like that, hard to describe feeling off- Outside of what's maybe outcome based or logical, it's that thing that excites you a little bit, and then it's draws emotional. you towards something. Yeah, it's a bit emotional. It, it it gets you trying something. It's maybe linked to curiosity for me. It, mm. That's probably how I would park passion. And after hearing what you said, my immediate thought to that is, passion is an emotional spark of some sort. Yeah, an emotionally yeah. sparked piece of curiosity kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's emotion based, it's curiosity based, and it's a spark. Yeah. It's like a something ignites and you're like, oh, wow, this feels good. Mm -hmm. And definitely another component about passion for me is time melts away. Yeah, for sure. Flow state happens a lot in passion, right? So let's see what Google says. Passion uh, definition. Let's see what Google says. <laughs> okay, so Google, wow, it's so succinct. All right. Uh, the dictionary says passion is Strong and barely controllable emotion. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, I got the emotion bit. Yeah. All right, you get so, bonus points so, for this one. Yeah, I get bonus points. No points for you. But like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting that strong and barely controllable emotion. Yeah. So it's almost something that you, like, you just, you can't control. That's interesting. Mm. Hmm. That's why I guess they say it's like a burning desire, right? It's just this burning desire to do something. It's passion. Okay. So yeah, draw the input. Yep. if we, if we just kind of go with that, if that's what passion mm -hmm. is, what, one thing that I think is really interesting that Cal talks about here, I've got my notes in front of me is that mm -hmm. he says, passion can sometimes be confused with three things. And, and this was based on a self determination theory that Mm -hmm. I think another author, Dan Pinkman, talks about his yeah, book yeah. Drive. Talks about yeah. this, yeah. and it says that you you will feel motivation when these three conditions are met. The first one is that you have autonomy, meaning you know mm -hmm. you've got control over your day, you've got control of your 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 actions. So autonomy. The second thing is competence, and that's essentially you feel good at what you do. You like you're good at what mm -hmm. you do, so they're so good yep. you can't ignore your part. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is relatedness, which is a feeling of connection with others. Mm -hmm. So autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Yep. I think when you have those three things, it can make you feel like you're passionate about something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it For can sure. be confused. It can get mixed yep. up in all of that. Yep. And, and, and I mean, is it separate? Is it different? Yeah. I think... It all interrelates. Right. It has to. This is all interconnected. This is not. Yeah. Like, I don't think passion can be binary. It's the same thing as motivation. Yeah. Like, motivation isn't fixed. Passion isn't fixed. Being competent at something that you do isn't fixed, right? Because it's always mm. changing. So that's the bit where I think his theory completely hits the mark, though, where I think he, can, he talks about it. It's like so, uh, similar to what you said. Like to do, his argument is essentially to get a really meaningful career, it can't just be based on loving something. It needs to be based mm. on control. I think it's impact and maybe it was aut uh, autonomy, you know? So mm. having, uh, I might've butchered that, but there was three sort of sections that he says need to be met for you to have uh, autonomy, long term Autonomy, it's autonomy, yeah. competence and relatedness. Yeah. So, so having those, those three, that to me makes perfect sense for long-term sustainability because mm. passion might be fleeting. Like we said earlier, that's a bit like lust, you know, it's, it's the same mm. thing as starting a business all well and good that you get started. That's one step in it. But once you started, that doesn't mean that it's finished. There's a whole nother 
five, 10, 20 year business. It's the same with any job. You can go and start in. It's super exciting. You're solving new problems. You're learning things. That doesn't mean that you're going to stay in that job for five years or 10 years. And I think that's what he's really talking about is that fair enough. We live in a world now where everyone can go and do something that they really love and care about, but that might be a trap for a lot of people because they're going to have these unrealistic expectations of what that thing that they love is going to deliver for them. You know, and and that's maybe the downside of the new way that we work and live and how interchangeable roles are and careers are and you can go and start something new and start a side business and do all those things. What he's kind of saying, which is I think is really, really bang on the point, is that don't expect that thing to completely change your life and be your vehicle and you to be amazing at it without doing any of the work. And that's, I think, the the downside of the thinking. If you look at you know, and calling out the Gary V's and the Tim Ferris's who I think are great. But the downside is, is yeah, fair enough. Go pursue your dream, go hustle, but it's yeah. not going to make any difference if it's not combined with some of this other stuff. And he's talking about substance here, I think. Yeah. Well, well, again, building that, that, that skill mastery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, while you were talking, what, 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 you, what you made me think about is, I look at the younger generation now and look at us being all old talking about, yeah, let's oh, talk yeah, about the younger yeah, generation. Yeah, back in our but, day. But I look at, yeah, I've got to do in this voice states. while I do this. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> in, in my era. Yeah. But when I, yeah. look at my, when I look at my younger cousins and, mm. you know, my, my sibling, my younger brother or my, my other cousins that are younger, I find that they're, they're not entering as many relationships as when I was young. Like I, I had a lot of partners and, you know, mm-hmm. went through relationships and whatnot. But, but to them, it's also because they have this idea that I'm going to find the perfect person. Mm. And, and I bring us back to this because I think that it, it is a problem. And I'm seeing this so much in the younger generation in that, you know, the, 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 the jumping between jobs, trying to find that fulfillment, trying to find that, that kind of essence of life and, and, and meaning in life. And I'm saying this because I feel like we live in a world now where mastery is no longer really pursued and valued. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then that's also partly because the apprenticeship model is no longer really pursued. Mm. No, no one, you know, is that the master and the student that doesn't happen as much anymore, no. which also leads to less mastery because when the master is there teaching the student, they force you to master something before they teach you the next step. Yeah. You know, until you get wax on wax off, we're not learning the crane. Yeah. You know, and, and I think <laughs> no well, one's that's, waxing well, that's on and though. waxing off right now. No one's waxing <laughs> or waxing off. Everyone's just, you know, everyone doesn't want to go, oh yeah, I got this. This is easy. Yeah. And, and the chronic problem that I do see that has led so many of the youth to unhappy or chronic unhappiness is because you haven't spent long enough in that job to build enough mastery to lead you to a point where you get fulfillment from what you do. And, and let's connect that, right? Let's connect that to what Cal says. Because or not Cal, but the self-determination theory, the research. And this, this research was done 40 years ago, so it was a while ago, but currently it's the best understanding that science has when it comes to human motivation. So, so that's all we have to go off. And, and when, you get, when you become a master, when you become so skillful at something, you will get autonomy, you will get that competence, and you will get relatedness. And, and this is why. And tell me if you have any thoughts on it, but it's mm-hmm. when I get really good at what I do, yeah. The people around me will give me control, right? So, so if, I'm, if I'm really good as a teacher in the realm of communication, or if I'm really good as a keynote speaker, the bureaus that I work with, my manager, they give me free reign. I can do what I want. It's okay. You know, we're not going to force Vin to, to prepare for seven hours before he does a keynote. No, he's good at what he does. Let him do his thing. So I have yeah. my autonomy. When, and when I'm really good at something, I'll get the feeling of competence. I'll feel good. I feel good at what I do. And then also relatedness. When I'm really good at what I do, I build better connections with people because when I work with them, they're like, oh man, that was, thank you. Your work was amazing. And then the connection or relationship you have with others is improved. So, so to me, if passion is you know, this blurry thing that combines all of those things, if you get really good at it, then you can get the feeling of passion. Mm. Whereas yep. if you don't and, and you keep moving career paths and, and you don't master, and I mean really master something, mm. then you don't get to play in that zone of passion. It's, 
Yeah, you're bang on. And this is an interesting question for you. Is do you think mastery is possible for everyone? Like, do you do you know many people that have yes. mastered yeah. something? Look, I, I think yes, but it has to be like yes, but not in all areas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't think mastery is possible for everyone in all areas. I think every <laughs> like okay, back to what we said in the beginning. We're all born with something like mm. there, there's something about everyone. And, and now, now having had a child and you having two, I'd love to hear what you think, mm. but every kid is born with something like, you know, I know mm. this about your two kids now, you know, you tell mm, yeah. me one is born and kind of needs people needs connection. And the other is born and it's just, I don't need anyone. Yeah. I'm fine. Fully, I'm a confident fully young certain. four year old, <laughs> fully certain yeah, of who I am yeah. and what I'm doing in life. Yeah. He's four. He could move out right with- now and sustain oh, yeah. himself. That's right. <laughs> and start a business, build a four million dollar right, revenue business in twelve yeah. months, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is, like, so so everyone is born with so vague, but something. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You can master that something. Mm. That's the something you can master. Mm. Everything else, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, does that go back to the capital theory? And we'll provide some context, but Cal Newport yeah, give the context. About, give the context. So I'll, I'll do my job in giving context. So Cal Newport, he talks about we all have capital in certain areas, and I think he calls it career capital, where mm. there are things mm. and actions and experiences, and, and it makes sense, you know, whether it's social capital or experience capital, skill capital that that exists just based on how our lives have panned out. And generally speaking, most people will have some area of capital in some space Um, and then utilizing and how do you go about then utilizing that capital and potentially connecting that with meaningful work right so so i think what your what sticks out to me when when you're saying that is i think innately even when we are kids when we're three four five years six years old there are areas in life that we are really interested in that starts building that capital you know, like, like, even if you look at the kids, like my, my eldest is now in grade one or two, there are certain areas where he just has more of an innate skill set or finds things a little bit easier. will do those things in his own time without being, you know, told by my wife, who's a teacher to tell him to do it. You know, it's just more natural. Like if somebody tells him, oh, Marcel, you need to go and uh, shoot a video or present to your class. He's like, yep, yep, yep. Or like up and ready. He just loves it. Absolutely. That it's like, Marcel, you need to do a maths test. He's like, you can see the face just drop and I don't want to do a maths test. You know, so there, there, there are these innate things that we probably all have, but maybe because of society and the way it is, I think a, sometimes a lot of us, we maybe get pushed away or pulled away from those innate areas. And that's what I think a lot of people are also searching for is they have this inkling that due to whatever circumstances, whether it's financial, economic, what opportunities are available, you know, Maybe it's the feeling that why people have this desire to pursue their passions, call it, or doing something that they love is because they just don't feel completely aligned with Mm. what it is that they're currently doing. And that might be related to that, call it natural skill set or whatever it is. Uh, Like artists stand out to me a lot because it's really hard to make a career out of your art. And I've got a few friends that are amazing musicians and artists and some of the, like they've mastered that skill. They're, they're at a nine or a 10 in that skill, but the market or the environment just has never really allowed them to, uh, to use that skill to support them, you know, fully. And then they've had to go into the corporate world or they've had to do that. And they've just got this little thing around, well, I'm doing something, it's fine. It makes, it helps me look after my family, but I don't genuinely love it. And that's where that, that passion reality work mix, it's that weird gray area where, I think you have to be super bloody lucky to be able to do something that you're passionate about and love. Like that's just the reality of it. There's, there's huge common. luck. There's huge luck. Massive amount. Yeah. Of luck. luck is a very big component of a lot of, but, and, and this is the danger as well. Right. And I just quickly want to speak to this point is that so many people pursue their passions and very few succeed at it. And when the ones that do succeed at it, when they write a book or when they share a thought, and that's yeah. why I'm so hesitant to even write a book is, is it's got to be so biased. It's what, what about the, 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 the hundreds of other magician speakers that wanted to go out there and build a keynote mm. speaking career that didn't make it and did the mm. exact same thing I did 
and they yeah. didn't make it. So it's it's so biased. But that but that's why this book again is so powerful, mm. in that it's trying to let's do away with the simple one liners. Do what you're passionate about. Chase your dreams. You know, yeah. and and also there's there's courage culture now as well, right? Which is linked to the passion mm. kind of thesis in that, you know, if, if the only thing that's holding you back is fear. And no, there, there's actually more holding you back. The, the lack of skill that you have is also holding you back. Your lack of determination and lack of discipline is also holding you back. And and again, I think it's it's a. Oops. Vivian. I'm not sure if I'm frozen or if Vin's frozen, but hopefully we'll get the connection back shortly. Looks like he's coming back. Here he is. Cool. That's hilarious. There you go. Okay, we're back. Okay, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. And, and also, I didn't charge my laptop, so negative 10 <laughs> points for me. <laughs> okay. So we, we we're back. Okay. Look. You were just about to say the most profound thing that you've ever said, oh, and then we just no, lost no, it. I wasn't. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. What I, what I wanted you to define more with clarity is yeah. talk to me more about career capital. Let's stay on the career capital yeah. point for a little bit and not, not get yeah. too sidetracked. Yeah, okay. Cool. So career capital. It's just experience, right? And it's it's what what you have – a level of expertise in that you've built up over a, a five to 10 year, a longer term time horizon, you know? And I, I, well, the thing that really stood out to me was the apprenticeship model. And yeah. so few of us, that's how you do build things like career capital. Like, like if you look at the world today, how it's so hard to get focused in to even do something for a month without getting mm. distracted because there's so yeah. many distractions. Like, like the Bloody world is days. <laughs> Like I, I always imagine what it would have been like in the Renaissance, you know, like in the Da Vinci, Michelangelo days where there's no distractions. There's just this group of artists sitting there painting and learning art, learning off all these masters and having full focus on that one vocation. That's mm. not really something that exists in our world outside of maybe being at university or being – like there's no real avenues for specialism well, I, I guess the only uh, place uh, that I can think uh, of right now for for apprenticeship model is like, mm. I don't know why I think of the locksmith and also think yeah. of mar martial arts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, well, oh, and okay. maybe maybe the trades, right? Like if you look at it in our society, it's it's being a tradesperson. And yeah, funny yeah, enough, absolutely. like if I look at my mates that are in the trades, generally speaking, they just love their jobs. You know, like maybe they don't love it all the time and they have average bosses sometimes and they have all that. But but I know when they're actually in the vocation and they're building something and they've got that level of depth, I think it's pretty easy to go into a flow state and you see something come out at the other side. Pretty cool, cool type of apprenticeship. But yeah, I think, yeah, that concept of, what about for you? What, what do you think career capital Means. Well, 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 for me, I, I took away career capital as being what is the masterful skill you can build that gives you cash to be able mm. to gain autonomy, to be able to gain competence, to be able to gain relatedness. Mm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to me, it's like, okay, let's say we're, we're all accountants in our accounting firm, right? Yeah. If we're all accountants in the accounting firm, then how do how can I build career capital that makes me extremely valuable? Because mm -hmm. I mean, the other idea in the book that that Cal talks about is well, sure, if you want a passion filled job, then to get that, you need a really rare skill. Like yep. to 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 get what you want in life, to get everything you want in life, that then you you better have a really valuable yep. rare skill. Yep. Yep. So, so then to me, it's like, well, you have to start thinking about whichever career you're in, what's the rare skill set that you can bring into this realm? And I think, I think that's one of the, the biggest contributing factors to my career as a speaker. I, and again, not to sound like an egotistical wanker, but it's like, I, I felt like I was able to build a very 
good career path as a speaker in the USA in the last four years. And I think that was because I had career capital to deploy. Yep. I, yeah. I had the skill of magic and, and I had done years of kind of vocal training and also theater training. So I had my strong stage presence and I, I had my keynote well written out and polished. Mm. So when I went to the US, I, I didn't, you know, I had, I had the career capital to deploy. I had the rare skill and, mm. and I had the rare kind of, mm, maybe not mindset, but I had the rare qualities that, that allowed my career to, yeah. to, to really take off. Yeah, I think you just hit a really cool point there. What I think you were able to do, you were able to find the dots of yours that had that inherent value, and then you were able to connect those. Because what's really interesting about your story as well, it's it's not like you were a performer from the age of four or five. Like you were going down the path of being an accountant, which is essentially the opposite of where you are right now. But yeah. You, I think inherently you knew that that wasn't the path and you couldn't see that playing out longer term. So you mm. did the hard things to develop the the rare and valuable skill set. But I think what you were able to do is probably your way to distill things and find out where the impact is and what you had to master and learn and being able to just sort of use the hacker mindset and the tinkerer mindset of just going into the shed and then you came out like the way I imagine it is that you pretty much went away into the shed. You came out where there's a montage that happens. You come out on the other side of the montage and it's like, hello, I'm a magician. You know, like that's pretty much how. Well, <laughs> but, but you know, what you're talking about there is, is interesting because I think for me, it was easier to, to master the world of magic. And, and, and let me tell you why. It's because in the world of magic, it's very clear the outcome you get when you master something. Because in the world of magic, when, when I master a trick and I go out and I perform it, I get that instant feedback from my audience. Like, oh my God, that's amazing. What the hell? How did you do that? Right? So, so there's a huge reward that's dangling at the end of mastery for every piece of magic that you learn. And a piece of magic could take you 20 minutes to master. And there's pieces of magic that will take you a hundred hours to master. Right? But, but, but the, 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 the carrot that is dangling on the end is very clear and visible. Mm. Yeah. Whereas I think in, in a lot of other professions, the carrot that's dangling on the other end, the reward, it's not as clear. Yeah. yeah. The, the trick either and, and, works or it doesn't work, right? There's, there's a clear- <laughs> There's no yeah, in so between. Like, yeah. It's like stand-up comedy. People are actually going to laugh or they're not. There's no in between. You, you yeah. can't be kind of- Yeah. That, that's kind of cool that- Vocations like that where it's very binary and success can yeah. be measured on it either working or not working, I think in a way are easier to end yeah. up mastering. A little bit like video Correct. games, right? Like video games yeah. keep giving you continuous feedback loops mm -hmm. of, all right, you're playing it well, you're playing it well, you're playing it well, you're not, start again, game over, go again, right? And it trains you down that. Whereas in life, it doesn't really, there aren't all that many things that well, exist that have such a linear... Well, well, Maybe what, they what do. that means, well, what that means is there's a piece of insight that we're talking about here that, that Cal doesn't even mention. And it's mm -hmm. that the path to mastery requires feedback, consistent feedback, because the more feedback we get, the more likely we are to be motivated to actually get better, right? Yeah, for sure. Whereas I find for that sure. a lot of the times we don't get good feedback and it crushes our soul. This is maybe this is one of the primary reasons that's not addressed in this book. Maybe this mm -hmm. is one of the primary reasons that people actually don't try to get better in their jobs because the mm. moment they do something out of, like the moment they try to do something better and they do it poorly, they get crushed for it. Yeah. Because, yeah, because sure. I, I, and I also think a lot of managers and a lot of people who, who manage people don't know how to give feedback in a loving and supportive way. Ooh. Yeah, there, there, there's so much there. The, the, the thing that stands out that links to career capital for me too, is he, he talks about the law of financial viability yeah. as a measure, yeah. as a measure of knowing whether you're on the right track. And I think that to me really stands out. If I'm giving the advice to somebody to go and pursue their passion, that would be one of the first things that I'd probably be asking them is that, all right, if you're mm -hmm. going to embark down this road of passion and you're potentially going to sacrifice uh, your career or make a career change or, you know, whatever it is, go down a completely different road. 
Mm-hmm. The first question would be is, do you have some type of skill set that you could combine with this passion that has mm-hmm. value where somebody would pay you for it? Or have, has somebody actually asked you about that? Or do you advise somebody on that thing? Like, is there a level of expertise that exists that has inherent value? And I think it's not saying that this is about the financial outcome because there are a lot of things that you can do that are really meaningful that don't need to have a financial outcome. But I think value and financial value, it's just a really easy measurable metric and scorecard yeah. if but, something's progressing, right? Like you could be the best keynote speaker in the world, yeah. but at the end of the day, there is a validation point, which is how much is somebody willing to pay you per hour for that keynote? Mm. Because you can't well, then, if you, if you can't get a $500 keynote, you can't go around telling everyone you're the best keynote speaker in the world. <laughs> that only happens uh, it's not even about the validation. It's not even about that. I mean, I mean, well, well, well to me, mm. when you talk about money, it reminds me of a quote. And while scrolling to find it, it is that <laughs> this was said by I don't remember the gentleman's last name in the book, but I just wrote Derek said this. But he yeah, said, Derek, it is. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so he said yeah. money is a neutral indicator of value. By mm-hmm. aiming to make money, you're aiming to be valuable. Mm-hmm. So I, I love that because I used to have this mindset. Of And I didn't catch this the first time I read the book. I only caught it the second time. But the more money I started to make, the more I started to feel bad. Mm. Because I started to think, oh, man, am I just being evil? Am I being this money-hungry person as, you know, being a speaker? Being a speaker, I, 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 when I started my career, I got paid 400 bucks. And the last mm. gig I signed in Canada for 2021 was, was 40,000, right? Yeah. And I had a huge problem with that because I was like, ah. Oh, this, uh, have, I, have I become a greedy piece yeah, of crap? Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, what's yeah. happening? But, but to me, as an entrepreneur, this gives me such ease when I think about the financial upside because by aiming to make money, you're aiming mm. to be valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was sure. a big that was a big unlock for me by by looking at money and also related to what you're saying in that, you know, that financial viability. It, it's important. Mm. You, sure, do what you're passionate about, but but also make money because that's an yeah. indicator of value. Well, yeah, it's a scorecard metric, right? Like, because yeah. it, to me, to me, it's either you, you're going to measure it based on enjoyment and the the return you get for your time on enjoyment, or you're going to probably measure it based on the financial return that you get. And and I think it depends on where you are in life. Right, because say for example, and and this is a big thing that's probably happening in culture at the moment, where and and maybe even because of COVID, will people sacrifice money for greater enjoyment, or will they focus on enjoyment versus money? Because if you look at it, maybe in the seventies or eighties, that corporate mm-hmm. culture was all about get to the top of the ladder, you know, earn earn six or seven figures. It was a very Wall Streety type of thing, and that existed for maybe a ten year period. And then if you look yeah. at say the last 10 years, it's been more about do what you love, you know, don't, <laughs> don't worry about, you know, just, just live in a tiny house. Like there's all these <laughs> new things that are happening in counterculture, right? Which, which all makes yeah. sense as well. Like it's like the fire movement and mm. the, the lifestyle design movement. So, so there is the, the, the long story short there, there is no one size fits all realistically. There are multiple ways in today's world that you can probably live but it's finding what works for you the best. But, but the yeah. core, the core principle there, and I love Derek Sivers' stuff. If people haven't checked him out, he's he's just an amazing thinker. He's got short books that really easy to digest. But this is a guy that he, he essentially built. He wanted to be a musician. He built a twenty five million dollar business called CD Baby. It's probably got the best. I think welcome email that you'll ever read if you search Derek Sivers welcome email where he says like each each CD's been wrapped and magically like <laughs> pampered by kittens and <laughs> it's you know like, it's amazing I'm not going to butcher it and not do it justice we'll add a link to it later on but but the way he thinks about life and and he's the same one that has that theory off it's either if it's not a hell yeah it's a hell no you mm. know and, and he's just got these really cool methods so I think the fact that he's the one that points people towards that direction of do what you love potentially and do what you're passionate about, but make sure it's something where there's enough inherent value where somebody might pay you for it. Because at least that will then validate to you whether is this just something that I should do purely as a passion and not put the weight off it having to support me potentially financially or support my family? Or is this something that, oh, I could actually turn into something that 
maybe becomes my vehicle. And that's, I think, the big difference that you can get lost in. Like, like I, I get scared when people are like, oh, man, I'm quitting my awesome job and just going to go pursue my passion. It's like, all right, have you, have you thought about this a little bit? Like, do you need to go all in like that? Is there, is there a staggered approach where maybe you could build that skill up a little bit while you work and then you go and try it? <laughs> I don't know. You've, you've, you've become the Asian parent. It's, it, 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 what the hell you want to quit the job no uh, no you you no very bad idea right so what, what's what's what's, inter- what's interesting is what what you made me think of just now is my conversation with my parents like what made yeah. my parents ultimately support me i mean in my yeah. keynote you know I, I share a very short form of the story that you know i told my parents i want to become a magician they supported me and and you know i share that story but i leave out a lot of details because of the nature of a one hour <laughs> keynote right you know it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a 3 minute conversation where they're like oh of course we'll support you you know yeah. th- th- there was definitely the asian factor of what the hell no no yo, my heart oh my heart hurts so much ow ow you know like it's just they pulled every guilt card on me like we travel the ocean we go through the war oh my heart oh you're going to kill me boy you go oh i die now it was very it was very it was very traumatic for me because every card was pulled out but here's here's what i'm getting at there's a point to this and it's that i didn't just go i didn't just i went to my parents first of all going hey i want to do magic right that didn't work they they kind of went no then, then I was like, huh, okay, that didn't work. Let's change the methodology. Let's change the approach. So what mm. I did was I then went out and got close-up magic gigs. And, and I started getting close-up magic gigs that were paying me at the start 200 an hour, 400 an hour, 800 an hour. And then I got paid 1500 bucks for an hour of close-up magic. And I remember this specifically. Mm-hmm. I remember making about 10 grand as a close-up magician. And I made it in about a month. And then I sat down with my parents. Card, no, not card. Cold cash money. I put 10 grand on the table and I said, I made this in the last four weeks. Okay. And at the time I named one of my family members and I go, as an accountant, they made four and a half thousand. I made 10 grand. Oh, that's. And I did this doing magic. And then, and then I, I, I remember so clearly it was my dad, the first one. He goes, Oh, this is very good, man. Mm. <laughs> And, and it's just, and just this, because you have to understand, uh, I think, I think, I think people that are like funny, Asian or my, Indian my or parent, ethnic my- will, will not understand <laughs> this. Like you, you nearly have to live our lives for it to, to make complete sense. Yeah. No, but, but then, but then all the, all the Asian, all the Asian parents are listening, right? They're like, oh, this, this is what my child need to do. Put 10 grand hard cash on the table. Then you'll do what you love. But it's like. And then all your cousins are all magicians now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but that that talks to the the viability of the the financial side, right? When I showed yeah. them that, yeah. that was the key move that I played that opened up their minds. Mm. Because before that, when I was just kind of fluffy and going, "Oh, I want to do what I'm passionate about. Oh, this makes yeah. me happy. Oh, this," to them it was like, "There's no practicality in what you're saying." No. Yeah. But then when I showed them the practicality and the financial viability of this. That changed the game because my parents, you've got to understand, man, I, I, I think for, for, for most immigrant parents, even including yourself, Ali, is that our parents came to this country with nothing. Mm. They are burdened by fear. And that fear is something that is chronic, man. It's something that stays within their head. Mm. So the moment that I showed them this, that was almost like an antidote to fear when they went, huh, hang on. Maybe doing what my son enjoys is actually yeah. not as risky as I thought. Mm. So, so, so it's interesting in that, that that financial viability not only was important, you know, in this book, but but a, a part of it played out in my life when I showed them this. And then, and then, you know, what my dad said? My dad goes, "Okay, okay, then then do this for another two year before you quit uni." Right. So to yeah, him, yeah. it was like, yeah, you, you got to make sure you make 10 grand every month now for the next two years. And I, I kid you not, I had a call from my mom last week and the call from my mom was like this. She goes, she goes, Hey, look, um, look, I don't mean to be barging in with your, your personal finances, but, but how much money are you making this month? Are you okay? Has COVID impacted you? And like, yeah. she, t- she is still concerned yeah, and I'm yeah, a thirty yeah. mid thirty year old man, and she's still and that you know mums will forever be mums, but yeah. she was just like she was deeply concerned, like you know, son, I know you you know I know you're paying for our health insurance, and and mm. can you still pay for that? Are you okay? And I was like, wow, yeah. 
that fear in them of me chasing this career path that's not a professional career, they still worry all the time that I'm not making any yeah. money. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 the concept of security is really interesting. <clears throat> yeah. It probably doesn't get touched in the book that much. But I, th- I think even well, in light of COVID yeah. and what's happening in the world at the moment, again, when you look at, you look at societal patterns, potentially, but like if, if generally speaking, especially say in the Western world over the last 10 or 15 years, pretty mm-hmm. abundant economically, you could predict yeah. with a level of certainty, right? Like if you had a relatively secure job, you're probably not worrying that your company's, you know, for the most part, again, broad generalizations, life was relatively predictable prior to mm-hmm. February or March for, for the Western world. Um, whereas now, this is, especially for people in our sort of generation, this is probably the first time we've experienced a really significant economic global event, realistically. Yeah. Like, yeah, there was the GFC, but fortunately we were lucky in Australia. We didn't really get impacted too severely um, mm-hmm. in the US and other places. It was obviously a little bit different, but, but I wonder now how this concept of following your passion and what that looks like in this new world, potentially, how does that shift and change? Like, will more people pursue their passions because they're like, well, I'll just downsize. I'll live a more simpler lifestyle and I'll just do something that I love because now they've been working at home and they've tasted that, oh, I don't need to work 90 hours a week going into the office. Like maybe this is the perfect opportunity to go and build some capital in a different area and pursue that. Or will they go the other way and try to find something super secure that's maybe a lot more COVID proof, essentially, mm. like would it be government jobs or, uh, you know, working in healthcare or like, like, will that change? Well, you know, I look at my own actions when you say that, and I think I did both. Mm. <laughs> so you, you know what I did immediately when COVID happened? I, I went, okay, when I got back to Australia, I got back to Australia about seven weeks ago. And when I got back to Australia, my immediate action was I'm reaching out to all my government contacts, trying to build connections within government so that I can build my, you know, my programs into some, at least with, with some government clients. Mm-hmm. So, so I immediately did that play because I immediately went security. Mm. But then when I, you know, as time kind of went on, I went, oh, okay, I'm, I'm overreacting. I'm overreacting on the safety side. So then that's what made me think, well, and I'm so glad you said this because initially when you said during this COVID time, should people still pursue their passion? I, I think we have to reframe the pursue your passion thing. I mean, the one thing I learned from this book is pursue skill mm. in an area that you may be lightly passionate in. Because how do how can you be fully passionate in anything? I don't think we, we're ever, nah. I'm super passionate in this. Well, yeah, but then do it and try to commercialize it and be a professional in it. Probably won't last long, right? Mm. So in our lust areas, build skill in that. Mm. Yeah, for and sure. I think during during this COVID time, I think it's important to do both. I think it's important to build skill because then at the other end of it, you'll be hugely valuable. Mm-hmm. Because if you just mm-hmm. do what's secure now, and you go, oh, I'm just going to go for that job, and then there's there's no area for advancement, there's no area to build and master a certain skill set that makes me valuable. Then at the end of COVID, and at the end of all this craziness, you're going to be bland. Mm-hmm. You're going to be me goreng noodles without the flavoring yeah no one wants to eat that <laughs> like no one does i mean let's be honest no, with the flavoring is everything so to the, me, that, that could be the quote for this episode that, that could be the quote but don't <laughs> be don't me goreng, goreng without, without the, the ingredient of the, the flavors <laughs> couldn't even say it succinctly <laughs> but, but, but that's what i think <laughs> Yeah. But so I think, okay, let's go with that analogy. I think throughout this pandemic, you need to create as much skill as you can. Mm. I mean, you look at the GFC, right? I, I, with the, moment, the moment COVID kind of happened, I immediately looked up stories and articles written on businesses that, that succeeded during the GFC because I, I kind of, I, I foresee us going into somewhat of a recession, et cetera. So I have to go, what did they do last recession? Because I had no idea. I wasn't paying attention. Mm. I was into cars and all I cared about was cars and girls, right? So I thought now being an adult, having a family, what, what do I need to focus on? And the businesses that made it through the GFC and flourished at the end of it were the ones that invested in their people to develop skill. Mm. So, so to me, when you look at our situation right now, what's important is, sure, you've got to be pragmatic, have some 
type of security, but then you've got to bloody well have a plan on how you can become extremely flavorful at the end of this and extremely desirable at the end of this and extremely masterful at the end of this. Otherwise, you're me goreng without bloody flavoring. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. And I, I love the way that, like even watching the way that you've approached COVID, I think it's been really impressive the way that you've pivoted, the moves that you've made, the way that you've adapted to it. And, and I'm like, I'm just reflecting on it as well around kind of how my thinking has shifted as this pandemic's evolved, because I, I'm mm. really big on analyzing as many of the variables as possible. And I think the thing with COVID is that it gives you no shortage of imagining every single scenario and option, right? Because there's things that we're considering now that you just wouldn't have considered six months ago. Things like, all right, what does like even to the level now of what does a longer term recovery look like? Whereas mm. I think initially everyone's like, oh, well, uh, it'll bounce back and then we'll just have to make up for the two, three months it's lost and it should be back to normal. But I think now there's a greater reality that the, the new normal is going to be probably pretty significantly different to, to what it was prior. But it's even things like uh, if you have plans that were internationally related, you know, like so many of those moves were kind of wiped out. So I think the the really interesting thing about COVID is, with the dot, I love the analogy of dots, you know, and maybe that links to career capital and passions and doing what your skill, whatever it is. But I think there's there's dots around, like even now in this COVID world, there's a heap of dots, and we've all got our own set of dots at the moment. Some are probably smaller than what they were, and others are I, I, a little bit I, more I magnified. No, I, I have no idea what you're talking about by dots. What are you talking about? What do you mean? <laughs> so, like, so I look at dots as like, so you know, you collect the dots. So we all have like dots and moves and potentially. Are you, about, are you talking about Steve Jobs quote? The dots don't no, connect moving forward, but the dots connect oh, moving backwards. Maybe loosely, but I'm just thinking about it more like yeah, I'm trying to picture what I've got right now. So say if you've got a whiteboard and there's yeah. 50 different moves that are potentially playable, look at them as right. dots. And then right okay. now we're, we're, we're searching for dots. Yeah, probably not as good as your me goreng analogy or quote. But it's terrible for compared to me. my me goreng analogy. I was like, what is he talking about? Dots? Like what? But okay. So you mean, yeah, just kind of yeah. like the moves, the different moves, the moves. As, as dots. Okay. Sorry. I got the, you now. The, yeah. different, the different moves are dots, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and, it's, and, and probably pre-COVID, those moves, dots, were maybe a little bit easier to connect and to predict and put yeah. together. Whereas now in this world, I think what's really interesting is how will we find the ones that are related to us? So again, find our capital in this new mm. world and then how we go about it. So it's interesting that one of your moves was going to like government clients and yeah. playing some of the downside. Like I'm, I'm reflecting on mine. And to me, I, one of the things that I really went back to was looking at this is what's the five or 10 year vision and trajectory mm. on where I'm, I'm heading and just getting, trying to get as comfortable as possible that some of that might just not happen as quickly as what yeah. we hope. But in the meantime, while it's not happening, what other things can be developed and potentially looked at? And I think that wrapping up that sort of thing is that it's a really important time now to probably, as you said there, develop some skills, yeah, maybe sharpen some skills that you've let go of and to find the ones that might be valuable in this new environment as this situation plays out. Because there will be things of value and those that act on it the earliest will end up having an advantage throughout whatever this period is. And in the new world, it's happened every single time there's been a drastic change. And I think this is a good time to bring in the whole point of the craftsman, craftsman mindset and the passion mm. mindset, the craftsman's mm. mindset and the passion mindset. Mm -hmm. And and to put simply the, the passion mindset really is about what is my job going to bring me? What is this mm. career path going to give me? What is the world going to give me? Whereas the craftsman's mindset is really about what can I do for the world? What can I create for the world? What value can I bring to the world? So one is kind of me, 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 me driven. And one is I will serve you or I'll serve yeah. the world kind of driven. Mm -hmm. So we, when you look at that and using that knowledge to then think about how we kind of navigate the COVID times, I, th I, think, I think more than ever, we need the craftsman's mindset. Because you, you have to think right now, how many people are in pain? How many people are suffering? How, how is the world suffering? So as an entrepreneur, this is 
there's, there, there's so much opportunity out there in the world right now because there's so many problems that need to be solved. Mm. So I think, I think it's so important now to engage in the craftsman's mindset to go, how can I add value to the world with the skill set that I'm building? So, so for example, the reason I bring this up is because mm. like for me, to my left, which you cannot see, is mm. me building out a virtual studio. I've been on the virtual studio bandwagon for the last four months since March. Like since March hit, I went, okay, I'm not particularly passionate about building out a production studio. I'm not passionate about learning how cameras work. I'm not passionate about learning audio stuff. I'm, I'm just not Ali. I'm just not. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, cool. Okay. Well, I get it. But with the craftsman's mindset, it's not about what this production is going to do for me. It's, it's more, this is going to allow me to still serve my clients. It, because I had keynotes lined up all around the US. I had keynotes booked up to the end of 2020. And then when COVID hit, I could no longer serve my clients. So if I focused on just what I was passionate about, I wouldn't have built the virtual studio. All I would have done this year, Ali, is did a podcast with you because this is something I enjoy, right? This, this, this podcast that we're doing is me following my passion, me kind of going, oh, you know what? I'm going to take a bet. We're just going to do something we love. We do this all mm. the time anyway on Zoom. Why not just capture it and put it online, yeah, right? Yeah, record it. Yep. So, but then to me, I, I went the craftsman's mindset with the other step because I thought to myself, how can I build a skill right now that is going to serve the world? So I've, I've still been able to serve my clients because I've got the studio. Mm. So the answer to what to do during this time, do you follow your passion or do you build a valuable skill? The answer is both. Mm -hmm. Yay. So, so <laughs> cheesy. It out. Yeah, we figured it out. I think it's a, clip, a clapping sound Yay. effect. <laughs> one of these buttons like does it, something, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, oh, <laughs> Chris, what was that one? You, the, <laughs> okay, I can hear his sound effects, but he can't hear mine. So you, you did the bow, 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 bow. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Well, that, that, yeah. that technically could have been the correct sound effect. That technically could have been the correct one. <laughs> <laughs> They're both correct. <laughs> well, but, but no, but, but really, I, I think we live in such a world yep. where we force, there's, there's got to be one right answer. It's either mm. black or it's white, mm. damn it. Whereas yeah. I think life is not black and white. It's, it's gray mm. as hell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the, the concept of acting from a position of service becomes really valuable in these times because it can be very easy psychologically and mentally to just go into a lens of what do I need to do to protect myself? And yeah. uh, that's, that's a very natural fear response for a lot of people. But what that then does though, it, it stops the lens and it, it nearly hampers the ability to capitalize on any opportunities that may exist. You know, so, so again, it's both. The answer is both. Like you need to shore up things and you need to be conservative and secure it, but you also equally need to have enough bandwidth to look for the opportunities is what I believe. And to be able to capitalize on those when they do eventuate, because if you get too scared or too, too much, um, if there's too much focus on that, let's consolidate, let's be conservative. Let's gather all the toilet paper for the next six months. You won't have room to store anything else. There's a good analogy. Come on. Oh, no, there, there's hey? a good there's a really good analogy. There's a, because but, because if you if you just store your entire house filled with toilet paper and go for yeah. security, then where's the room for the me goreng? <laughs> Combined it. Hey, one, two. Did you, did you see that? That was <laughs> yeah, that was that was, that was, that was yeah. liquid gold yeah. there. If, if, yeah, if there's anyone yeah, listening, yeah. that is that is <laughs> That is the highlight of the podcast because me go rang represents. There's the, no one the, listening. There's no one, yeah, there's no one listening. Who am I talking to? It's just you. They, they, trained, they tuned out about 75 minutes ago. And, yeah. and, and that's fine. But we'll, yeah, yeah. And, and, and look, let, let's, I want to give another yeah. real example, right? I want to give another example out of, out of my own life. And I think, I think the beauty of doing this, Ali, is that we get to share some of our journey too. So hopefully, mm. you know, this will inspire you as I share some of my stories for you to share mm. some of yours. But it's, as I was building, building my keynote career, I mean, th this book, I think helped me remedy a tough time that I'm going through. And it's that I, I, I initially 
I loved keynote speaking. I fell in love with it. You know, as I got better with it, I started to fall in love with it more and more and more. But then I got to the point where I no longer loved this career path. Mm. And I, I no longer loved this career path with intensity because I no longer had autonomy. You know, remember the three things, autonomy, competence, and the relatedness? And the moment I started to not have autonomy, and I didn't have autonomy because when clients had a conference in Chicago on this date, I had to be there. I couldn't control my time anymore. I had no control over my time. And then the more gigs I started to do, because I got to the point where I was doing about 80 plus events a year, then I had literally no control over my time because 80 events a year means that every gig I do, I lose two days of time. So I'm, I'm away 160 days, 160 days. I have no control over my time. I started to become extremely unhappy. And then I, 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 started to, I started to think and made the assumption that, oh, this is because this career path isn't right for me anymore. Oh, this is, this is the wrong career for me. This, I shouldn't be in this career. I should change careers again. But this book saved me as I read it the second time because this was something that didn't stand out the first time, but stood out now. I need to learn that. I need to learn to work right as opposed to finding the right work. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that I, I immediately fell into that mindset. Oh, I should stop speaking completely. I should stop doing this. I should find something new. I should, I should, you know, I, I don't know, do gardening. Like I just, and I genuinely went down that path of looking up building worm farms and how to have a good, I just really did. And then I just thought, oh, maybe it's not that. Maybe I just need to learn. I need to understand working right as opposed mm -hmm. to finding the right job. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Do you think a lot of people that do build a, a lot of, call it career capital, mm. do, do we throw it away because we are looking for that new, fresh, free, autonomous thing? Because that, that's also a natural thing that happens. Like as you become an expert in your field or as you develop a lot of career capital, as you get control, generally you'll also get responsibility. You know, like that, like what you're talking about there is that it's not necessarily that you hated the presenting or the keynote part of it. That bit, no. I'm pretty sure you still loved. You hated probably the pressure of knowing that you had to be here on a certain date, knowing that all these people were relying on you, that there was going to be thousands of people in the audience. Like you couldn't just take a day off one week before a keynote and get it rescheduled without there being some pretty major ramifications and essentially wrecking someone's entire event or the managers or the people or the marketing teams, like having that pressure. And I think that's probably what happens. Like even with the professional athlete mentality or the musician mentality where it goes from just creating your art, having control, being free, playing basketball, whatever it is, to now you've got managers and you've got contracts and you've got sponsors and everyone's scrutinizing what you're saying in the media and probably very similar in the entrepreneur, like being a business leader where you go from working in the garage, getting the idea out there with a couple of your friends and then all of a sudden you've got a team of 50 people and wages and <laughs> legal issues and all, all different things, debts, like, like the whole game completely changes. And then I think people are like, oh, well, I'm just no longer passionate about this, which might not necessarily be correct. Well, but that's <laughs> why you're so good in that you are able to implement systems within your business where you don't lose autonomy. Mm. Right. And I think that's a very valuable skill set. I think if you're able to implement enough of the systems, then you don't lose the autonomy. Then you kind of maintain that love for what you do. And, and, the reason I brought this up as well is it goes to show how important those three things are. You've got to have the autonomy. You've got to be competent at what you're doing. You've got to have relatedness. Mm. And the moment I lost one of them, I immediately went to the chronic problem that most people suffer from. Oh, I need to change careers. Yeah. Well, I, I, need to, I, need to just, I need to do something different. It's also probably balance in those three areas becomes really critical too, because you can be 100% free and autonomous but yeah, it might mean that you're unemployed, yeah. you know, like it, it's, I haven't figured out a way yet where yeah. you can just have hundred percent freedom. Like if I look at one of the things, you know, how he talks about mission and the concept mm -hmm. of maybe not going more with passion, but if you can align your career capital and your skill set and your competence with mission, that can you can talk also, more about mission, talk more, yeah. like, expand on that a bit before you, you, you talk about it. Yeah. Like it was interesting how he, 
how he kind of went through the concept of mission. But one of the lines here is missions require capital, right? So to me, mission is a sense of direction. It's yeah, like, like if I look at our mission with future golf, it's to, to change the game of golf, to build a really large golf community, right? But then that also requires a lot of capital. It requires a lot of people, a lot of partnerships, a lot of customers, a lot of members, right? It's, it's still housed under the umbrella of passion as well. But generally speaking, <laughs> I've just lost the train of thought a little bit there, but generally speaking, like when, when you're going and you're pursuing that mission and you do need the capital there, well, what was my point? I've completely lost my point. Oh, no, okay. I, yeah, I, I've completely... I don't even know what you're talking about. So what, yeah. <laughs> what let me let me tell you what what where I was where I was with my mind. And obviously professional. Just what is he even talking about? Um me goring and toilet paper. Let's go back to that. Yeah, no, yeah let's go. What, what I was what I was thinking with in terms of mission is that well, how do you know what your mission is? I think that's an important yeah. point. To talk yeah. About. How does someone work out what their mission is? And mm. what Cow is saying in his book, what I got from it was mm. that you will not be able to determine your mission until you've got career capital. Meaning mm. you will not be able to work out what your mission is until you're highly skilled at something. Because until you're highly skilled at something, you do not understand what kind of impact you can have. Because once you're highly skilled, then you have more impact. So when you're highly skilled and you have more impact, you understand how in which you're able to change the world. So when you are playing at that level of impact, you have more clarity as to what your mission can be. Because think about it. If you don't know what you're capable of and what your skills can actually do, then how will you be able to understand what you are able to do? Yeah, it's a good point. Like, and, and this is why it's so important for people to pursue mastery, because the more masterful you are at something, the more vision you can have about what you can change and what you can do and what impact you can have. Mm. And I, I just often think about the masters of the world that I really enjoy. And I love the world of magic. And, and like one of my favorite magicians, Darren Brown, what if Darren Brown did magic for five years and gave up? All of the amazing stage shows that he has right now, mm. they wouldn't exist. You know, Steven Spielberg, you know, what if he stopped writing? What if all these different authors stopped writing and they only, they only stopped writing at te year 10? Then all these amazing movies and books wouldn't exist. So to like Steve Jobs, what if he gave yeah. up early? Then we wouldn't have the iPhone. We wouldn't have all these amazing products that, 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 that I, I, I buy every time they come yeah. out. But it's like, I think to change the world requires career capital. It requires an immense amount of mastery. And, and I really feel like we, we need, I want to share this message with the youth because come on, if we, if you start to master something in your career, even if it's accounting lawyer, as a doctor, as, as a researcher, as a plumber, as an electrician, if you truly master it, imagine what happens when you get five masters that come together. What I'm talking about here right now is the Avengers, right? But the, the Avengers of our time are, is not superheroes. It's not Iron Man. It's not Thor. It's a researcher in the realm of cancer combines with a person who's mastered the ability to market online combined with another person who's incredibly good at communicating, for example, and then a videographer. And when they all come together, mm. they're the Avengers of our time. The cancer research that they're doing will get the funding 100% and get mass buy-in from everyone. So to me, we oh, should sell this to Marvel. Know. This is like the yeah, next really Marvel <laughs> universe. It's just like four dudes learning something. And, and <laughs> but that's the benefit of becoming so good they can't ignore you. It's so good that they can't ignore you when you have multiple people doing this and you come together. I think mm. something marvelous will come about as a result. Yeah. Well, break it down, right? As somebody who, so let's go to the the concept of mastery for a second. Mm. Like for me, before I met you, the concept of mastery was pretty alien and foreign because I just didn't know many people that had truly mastered something probably at the level that you've been able to master some of your crafts. But right. say someone sitting there at home and like a lot of us and my me myself is mastery is difficult and mm. 
there's a process involved for mastery. Mm-hmm. Say someone does have some capital in an area and maybe they're sitting at a six or a seven. What would be some of your tips to, to master a skill set? Well, well, to keep it relevant to this book, right? I think the book talks about a concept called deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is when you're practicing. I mean, look, there's this casual. I think practice can very easily fall into a realm where it's enjoyable. Practice in itself, if you're deliberately practicing to improve, to achieve mastery is not enjoyable. And I think that's, that's the hard part to grasp when you want to master something. The process of mastery is not enjoyable. And again, the most recent example is me setting up this virtual studio, us setting up this, this podcast to get it to look the way it does right now, for example. That was not enjoyable, Ali. It was frustrating. I enjoyed like it. You, yeah, well, yeah, well, you enjoyed it because you're new to it, but, but you enjoyed it because you have also a very low standard. <laughs> you, you did because you're like, oh. This looks amazing. I'm like, no, it doesn't, honey. It doesn't look amazing. This looks terrible right now. You know, and like to me, I just realized today I have to black out this window because as the sun comes up, that it changed my lighting, which is infuriating me. But like, <laughs> what, 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 what I'm saying is when we were going through this podcasting iterations, we went through like five or six calls. And every time we turned on the camera, I wasn't pleased with it. I went, ah, oh, we're mm-hmm. practicing, but it's not right. The sound doesn't sound right. Ah, oh, you know, the, the lighting wasn't right. You needed to buy the lights in the back so that it looks consistent. And not only that, we had little lines in our video. So to me, deliberate practice is when you push yourself to practice something. And, and the, 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 the example they used in the book was music. So one of the guitar players that they highlighted, for him to practice at getting better, he would play the guitar slightly faster than he was comfortable. And that led him to being, be able to be better at the guitar. And he just, he, you know, he, he gradually was becoming more masterful because he dedicated time to playing songs that A, were hard and B, playing the song slightly faster than he was able to, where he was guaranteed to fail. But that each time he did it allowed him to build some form of mastery. So to me, deliberate practice is critical. So are you dedicating time in your life right now to deliberately practice something where it doesn't feel good? Whereas to me, I can pick up a packet of cards and shuffle them and do all these nice moves. That's not practicing. It's not, it's not deliberate practice because that form of practice, when I do it, I'm just kind of showing off and enjoying myself. Whereas to me, to get to mastery means that you have to be so conscious of scheduling time where you engage with practice that really is annoying. <laughs> Mm. That kind of, that cognitive strain of, look, the cognitive strain we went through, Ali. Like your lights just went off. Oh, this is infuriating. This is, no, I'm but, but it's like, that, that needs to happen for me. Yeah. I have realized the benefit of that now. Before I used to just despise that, right? Mm. Like to me, I yeah. used to just hate the fact that my computer, my internet went down and my computer almost turned mm. off. How is your light just fixed? <laughs> hey? Your light is now perfect. Anyway, I just interrupted you for no reason. Continue. Yeah, yeah, well, because the sun, <laughs> the sun went down. It wasn't any magical power on my part. But, but what, what, what I was aiming to talk about there is you have to learn to love that mm. because you have to learn to see beyond the cognitive strain and the mental angst. That beyond that is, it lies mastery. And, and mastery, so many beautiful things live there. No one aims for that anymore. So if you want to truly do something that is outside the box, if you would, dare I say that kind of cliche, but if you, if you dare to do something outside of the box now, it would be to really double down and master something. Okay. And then I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm putting my foot down. I want to master this podcast game. I want to master this virtual game. And people who are watching this now, watch as we progress in this. I will not be okay with the same thing you see now next time. I'm not going to be okay with that. Oh, that makes me feel so uncomfortable. Like I just got sweat in my palms when you said that because I know that. (laughs) Ali, we can't get caught. But this is the thing. They talk about the plateau, right? The book talks about how all people get to a plateau. Mm. And once we get to that plateau, that's where unhappiness also lives. Yeah. So, and I don't know if others relate to this and if you even feel the same thing when you're working on a skill and mastering it, but you know, you either get the progress where you're getting those little wins. And what I find is I get comfortable when I see some of that progress and then I'll stop 
the practice because I'm like, oh yeah, it's good enough now. You know, like that's fine. I don't need to do any more. The, mo- the, the, the return the on investment no. is is gone. You know, like uh, as soon as I start seeing diminishing returns, I'm out. It's like, look, can we do something else? It's a little bit more interesting and fresh where there's a much more rapid growth process, mm. right? That's one part. Then the other part is when you do then say, all right, I'm going to dig deep and you set yourself a real big goal. Like I'm going to do this for 30 days and spend three hours on it. Then you get to day six and you're like, this is the worst thing ever. Like every (laughs) single benefit is not even worth it ever. (laughs) And your brain starts telling you like, no, we don't need to do this. It's stupid. It's pointless. Like this is good enough. It's fine. You know, here, love yourself, accept yourself for who you are. You just don't <laughs> need to go master this. Like, like, that to me is a really natural, yeah, uh, consistent and natural thought process that happens with nearly everything yeah. that I master. But whereas when I really do master something, it nearly happens accidentally just because <laughs> I've done it unconsciously and I've just done it for a really long period of time but I've been practicing it, but I haven't been like focusing on becoming the best at that thing or mastering that thing. But then I'll look back maybe eight years later or six years later and I'll be like, oh, I actually got pretty good at that. Well, Readings yeah. And I mean, and I mean, I mean, do we want to be it. leaving our lives to accidental mastery or, or can we be more intentional? Well, well, this is the thing, right? And then just for context as well, it's, it's that, you know, we often joke and say, you're the floor, I'm the ceiling. But, but I think one of the most beautiful things you've helped me do is you've helped me lower my standards, right? <laughs> this is, it sounds terrible, but it's actually amazing because you've like, again, if I keep things to the standard that I want them often in my life, I would never do anything. Yeah. I just wouldn't do anything. Yeah. There, there'll be nothing created. Everything will be kept in a secret vault and it will die with me. And, well, and I, think, I think one of the benefits I've been able to do for you is I've helped you raise your floor as well, mm, right? Mm. So I think we, this is why I, I really adore our friendship is, is that I think there's something in the middle where, where I'm here, you're here. And we go, maybe, maybe yeah. Mm. And I think the podcast is a representation of yeah. our two worlds colliding and it's it's kind of in the middle it's yeah. got you know my you know my kind of impact on it with the the lighting and whatnot and and you know the, the making sure the mic sounds really good and then it's got your occasional disconnect and you know your your occasional light turning off it's it's kind of it's just it's pleasant it's fall asleep <laughs> yeah. no, <and> I, think, <laughs> I, I think that is something that's because i think we play from different angles right like i try to yeah. turn the smallest thing into something from a really low base. Whereas yeah. you probably start like, you're not really going to engage with something unless you're doing it at a very high level. You'd rather yeah, say, yeah, yeah. I pack this away. We keep that inside. Whereas like I asked you this the other day and I think it's a really funny story to bring up where I asked you to rate your keynote and I think you gave it like an eight or a nine. And then I asked you a follow-up question. I'm like, well, name me three people in the world that have a better keynote than you. And you um denied for about five minutes. So you're giving yourself an eight or a nine when you genuinely are one of the best in the world at what you do. Whereas I'd probably do one keynote, watch it back and be like, man, I reckon that was like a six or a seven. Like that was pretty solid. The mic worked. Um, everyone seemed yeah. to like it. <laughs> like the standards well, completely. But- but I think that's what makes this friendship work, right? It's I like love how uncomfortable yeah. you got when I said that you were one of the best in the world. At yeah, I did. I couldn't face. even look you're at like, the camera. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, damn it. Fight the feeling of vomiting. But it's, well, another story that I want to bring up with that it highlights our friendship in this as well, in that, and this is just basically a show about our friendship now. Yeah, but yeah. hey, the beauty of doing this, it can be whatever we want. But what, what, yeah. what I find really interesting is, I was on my fourth iteration of my virtual online masterclass and I came back to Australia and you being the supportive friend that you are, you, you bought a ticket to my virtual masterclass and didn't even end up sending anyone. We'll, we'll make sure you send someone <laughs> next time. So super supportive friend, go, oh man, I support what you're doing. And then you created an online course within a week. You launched it. I saw it and I did not buy it. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not rewarding this low bar that you're setting. No, you have to do one more iteration and then I'll support that. And I, I just, and I told Pei Wen and she's like, you are a bastard. And I was like, monster. no, Absolutely no I'm monster. not a monster. <laughs> I'm not a monster. Is that, is that I just want you to know that there will be, there will be, there will be, there will be a line that I will not cross. And I, I want you to also 
raise the bar too. You know, yeah. I'll lower mine, but you've also got to raise it. So I think again, there's something to be said about the middle. I think the middle is is very powerful. 100%. It's a very powerful concept. I mean, yeah. I, I do love the fact that we we look at it from a yin and yang perspective, you know, because my thinking process behind that is I would way rather get something out there yeah. and then iterate it, even, even when it's below MVP, to give me mm. the validation to then see, is this worthwhile investing yeah. bandwidth, time and energy in? Whereas yeah. I know you're like, like even when I speak to Chantel, she's, she's a lot more like you. Like she's like, how could you just record that without editing it and putting it out there? Well, I'm like, and yes. my answer was, well, yeah, yeah. So my general answer is, well, I still think that the core message of what's being delivered, like say if the ultimate goal is somebody wants to start a venture, um, they'll be able to do it from listening to that course. Now, it doesn't mean that it's polished to an eight or a nine or a 10 or even a five or a six, but I'm like, at the end of the day, if they listen to that course and go through it, they should be able to start something. And if not, then there's a significant problem and I need to go and optimize it, change the content and then reiterate it. But I'd way rather get the feedback off the first 10 or 20 people rather than go and fully script, yeah. write and it out, record it, and then know that, oh, wow, this was so crap and I've just released something well, polished that isn't going to resonate. Let's talk to a deeper problem here. Let's go deep on this one. Now, one of the reasons why I feel so scared to release something that is not polished is because I think that is one of the problems of success. When you, when you become hugely successful at something, a bar is now set. It's kind of like actors who, who star in a really good movie and now, now the next movie they star in, it's, oh, are they going to be good or are they going to be crap in it? So, yeah. so you, you become super burdened by that that. You no longer can take the beginner's mindset, mm. but you're now stuck with a, a winner's mindset. And a winner's mindset is kind of dangerous because you're only used to winning. Mm. And once you get really used to winning, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you kind of look at yourself as a high performer, then, then you, you may not be able to maintain that high performance because of your inability to accept mm. a lower result, like a, a, yeah. a kind of crappy result, right? So, so when you said that, you gave me self-awareness on that. Ha. Huh. Maybe it's not just that I'm this perfectionist that wants to be amazing, but maybe it's also because I've gotten so used to the standing of, oh, amazing. You know, the, the standing ovations and the, the applause all the time that I am so scared now <laughs> to go, mate, that was, that was actually pretty shit. Like, I, I, I think I fear that like to the max, whereas you don't really fear that. And yeah. I think that's a benefit and in a superpower in itself. Yeah, well, the benefit... Well, and again, there's always a paradox. There's always a trade-off. The benefit for me is that it always, all, it just feels like upside. Everything that I do, when you start it from the underdog position, I'm mm. way more comfortable starting there and then exceeding the expectation and then gradually building that up rather mm. than setting the bar too high and then having to sit the uncomfort of going the other way. Because to me, that, that paralyzes action. If I yeah. sat there and I thought about getting that course completely right, I wouldn't have released it for five years mm. until it was to that standard. And then it would just mm. sit there and be locked away. Whereas if I do something in short bursts and just get it out there, now it'll inspire me to improve it if there's a few people now relying on it and there's some validation that it's worthwhile. So it's just the opposite lens of it. So, so if I look at it, it's, it's looking more at like, yeah, a very startup y style, you know, like grassroots startup y style of get out there, mm. iterate, validate. Whereas and yeah, yours you, is uh, a mastery style of no, get but it, it right. But it's, yeah, but it's not. Okay, okay. So, so here's the thing. And, and I, you know, this is why you're such yeah. a wonderful friend to me, but you have to have the willingness and the courage to shoot me down when you can too. I'll shoot myself down because you're not. So in, in this, <laughs> you're, you're painting me, you're painting me as this kind of brilliant master of doing all this stuff. But here's the, here's the danger in where I'm currently at. Where I'm currently at, because I've mastered this and because I'm so used to getting the accolades and, and the, you're amazing, you're brilliant, you're amazing. And because of my inability to start low, I will no longer master things. Mm. I, I live now in a world that is filled with danger of, I no longer will master anything and I potentially mm. can only do this one thing forever, right? Because Look, look at how, again, let's look at the example. Who was the one that delayed this podcast episode to? Me. 
right? Whereas we could have learned way more lessons. We could have been way more masterful by this time in this kind of point in time. Sure, the podcast may have looked more terrible and whatnot, but we could have learned so many more lessons along the way. And, and, and relating it to this book, because this book really, the core of it, the essence of it, so good you can't ignore you. What's the undertone there? Mastery. And, and I'm so glad we're talking about this. Otherwise, it would be completely off topic. But <laughs> that's why your mindset, having a lower bar is better when you're trying to master something. But then through the process of mastery, you have to mm. gradually increase the bar. You can't just keep the bar there, right? No, 100%. So, so I think Ali will help you start something immediately. And then I can help you continually refine to the point where there's yeah. no point refining, but I'll kind of keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like if I, yeah. if I look at my skill set, it's getting from zero to say 60 to 80% pretty quickly yeah. and being comfortable with that. And if I look at your skill set, it's you do that as well, but you, you're able to unlock the top, the top five, 10, whatever percent. You, you can hit the peak of something and, and focus in on that a lot more. Uh, that's where I see it. And, and I love that because to me, I see it as all this opportunity. Like one of the things that I see when, when I look at what you've built is that you've just got quality stuff everywhere. But because you've got that level of mastery, you probably, I always push you on that is to release more things out there because yeah. I think there's unmet value that people can benefit from, from what you create. Um, and then what you push me on is that my willingness to start stuff, you will push me once I find something to then improve it and then optimize it and to keep pursuing it when naturally I'm ready to move on to the next thing pretty quickly <laughs> after that. Like we'll do four episodes of this and you'll have to push me to <laughs> come for episode five and six because I'll be like, dude, yeah. we've already done the podcast. Yeah, we've, we've, like, we've finished like, the podcasting game. Like, like to me, I've got the lights, dude. Like yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's- uh, I, 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 think I will really fly to cool. Melbourne and bitch slap you if that's the case. We have to continue this. This is, this is, well, Lee, I think, and thank you. You know, I, I just want to say, you know, public recognition for you here, but just thanks for being such a great friend. Thanks you for too, pushing me to release things. Thanks for pushing me to do things before I'm ready. Because if I had to wait till I was ready, I probably wouldn't do much besides keynote speaking. Uh, that would probably be the end of my career, right? That'll be the end of, that, that's, all, that's all he did. And that's all he did, ladies and gentlemen. He just, Keynote speaking for the rest of his life, talking about the same thing. Did it thing. well. So. Did it well. No, I did, um, did do it quite well. Yeah, I, I, won't, I won't take that away from myself. Uh, but look, so and flip side to you, man. Thank you for pushing me to keep improving and mastering things, yeah. and for being like the thing that I love is how honest you are in the feedback because you set you set a higher standard to nearly anyone that I know, which is amazing. Yeah. Because if you're somebody that wants honesty and truth, which is Although I might start from a lower bar, I want to know how I'm progressing and I want the feedback yeah. loops. Like, like I don't get uncomfortable with criticism or negative feedback. You know, like yeah. to me, it's a, it's a driver. It's like, all right, well, if I'm aligned with this, my goal is to now prove it wrong and then to get to that level and then show the story of how do you start from completely average to getting to a level that's pretty significant. I love that climb. Um, so, so again, thank you for that because you then help it actually eventuate uh, past that initial growth period, which is cool. Yeah, man, I, I completely agree. Mm. So look, that's, that's really cool. And, and I think cool. what, what I really want to highlight as well is that we we're talking about how to build mastery. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about how, well, how do you actually do that before we kind of, you know, went off on that. Yeah, kind of for sure. But, but, but the, the, the whole book, what, what, another big part of the book that it talks about that I think mm -hmm. is definitely worth implementing into mm -hmm. your life. Again, mm -hmm. totally missed this the first time I read it, yeah. but it was, if you, you have to schedule time for deliberate practice. So the author and the examples he gave us, they tracked the number of hours per week where they were building career capital in the form of deliberate practice. Mm. Isn't, that, isn't that crazy? So, yeah, so often I think what, what, what breeds unhappiness in, in a lot of lives that, that, that I'm connected to, that, that I, I'm, I have deep connections with, they, they always tell me, they go, Oh man, I'm just, oh, I just, I just feel so flat. I just feel mm, just what I'm doing doesn't invigorate me. And I, and I also think the reason for that is because, well, you're not dedicating time to actually build that career capital by setting aside time to deliberately practice, to get better and become more valuable. Therefore building more connectedness, building more autonomy and just building more competence. 
So, mm. so I think it's important to think right now, you and your life, Ali, and me, and, and to those who are listening to us, think about how you can schedule time aside, even if it's one hour a week where you deliberately practice where it feels hard and go, you know what? I'm not going to give myself any slack or any room to be lazy here, but for the next hour, I'm going to do something that cognitively is straining. It's really hard to do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to dig into that a little bit deeper as well. So say, for example, let's pick something that you're mastering right now or that you've mastered recently. Are you able to break that down specifically around that journey of mastery? So whether it's a, maybe it was an example from magic or speaking, like for, for anyone listening out there so they can, because I think drawing out a roadmap for mastery is something really important that doesn't mm. exist for a lot of people. And I think we all, we can all kind of figure out how to get started and to get to that first 60, 70% period. Um, but then if you want to truly master something, what do you do? Well, if you pick speaking as an example, I, mm -hmm. I, I can kind of say with 50% confidence that I feel like I've, I've mastered that to some degree. Mm. I, I would say that one of the most valuable th things I did specific to that career in terms of mastery and getting from the you know, 80% to the say 95% mm -hmm. is reviewing what you're doing. I record nearly every single keynote that I do that I did. And I would watch it back. I would literally sit there and watch it back in 1.5 times speed. Mm -hmm. Not faster because then you lose some of the nuances in presentation. And then when I watch it back, I watch it with the knowledge that I've gained. So I may have read a book on humor. And once I read that book on humor, I've acquired the knowledge on humor. It's like I've downloaded it via the matrix phone. <laughs> then I go, now I need somewhere to apply it. So then I apply it to myself and then I watch myself and I go, oh, look what I'm doing there. I just read about and I just learned about this thing comedians call the apology face. And the apology face is when you do a joke and then you go, huh? Huh? It's funny, right? Huh? And then when I, I was like, oh, I'm doing the apology face. And then you go, oh, 1% improvement. Ding, ding. Right? And then. You, you read another book that teaches you about the pause and how you learn that, you know, when the pause accentuates the previous emotion. So if I'm really happy and then I pause, that's a pause of happiness. And, and if I'm really sad and I pause, that's a, that's a pause of sadness. So then you go, oh, I, I, did, I, I keep doing neutral pauses. I keep talking about something and then I just pause and then it's just neutral. I need to add an emotion previous to that so that when I do pause, that pause has more impact emotionally. So then, so then I'm going, oh, 1% of increase again. So then to me, the process of reviewing what I did was so incredibly important for the mastery process because we often don't review ourselves doing the thing that we do. We often think back to what we do and we go, oh, yeah, that keynote went pretty well. I think, yeah. That, that. And we know, all know our ter how terrible our memory is. Our memory is an awful, awful device. It's an awful thing. So to me, record and review, you have to think about how you can review what you do with what you do in your career path. Mm -hmm. And then you need to, so you need to, you need to review it, but then you can't review it with the same brain that has been doing it forever. The acquisition of new knowledge is incredibly important. So you must download new information and apply it to the present you. And the new information will allow you to level up 1%. And then you go, you acquire more new information, and then you apply it to the next version of you that's 1% better. And then now you're 2% better, acquire more information. So to me, it's the relentless pursuit of that. And, and say with speaking, for example, when, when you're picking the things that you want to keep improving 1%, are you just finding like one thing specifically, and then that's what you're scheduling in and focusing on until that's at a level of mastery? Or do you have four or five, six things that you're working on concurrently? I started doing one thing at a time, but the, you know, as you build your mastery, as you build your level of speaking ability on stage, as you become more comfortable on stage, I mean, the stage is my home now. Mm. I'm able to work on two to three things at once and I would rarely push it past that. Mm -hmm. 
Because if you do too many, then when you review, there's too many things to review. And then if you do mm. too many, you do too many of them poorly. But again, if I just worked on the pause and if I just worked on no apology face and just owning the humor moment, those are things I can very easily do really well in one presentation. Yeah. Yep. Because I find so look, that- I, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I find that I can do the scheduling part pretty well, but where connecting and being able to critically review it myself when i'm in that zone off all right like and just being able to focus on that one thing and knowing is this the right thing to be focusing on because that's also something that naturally happens is you'll sit there focusing on something and then i'll look at the bigger picture and i'm like oh well that doesn't really impact this part because it still doesn't all connect together it's kind of like working on it feels a bit like working on one bicep and you're like well what's the point <laughs> when the I've still got like a really, uh, the, there's no six pack, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, to me that the, I can't like logically make sense of focusing in on the one thing, but now you talking about this, I think this is really valuable around how you essentially br break it up into bite sizes and trust the process that if you go through all those one percenters, essentially, you will get a pretty well-rounded picture that will push us towards mastery. Whereas that, that's just something that stood out for me because personally, I think I move away from it because I can't see the value of the one percenter. Well, because you're focused on, you, you want the progress of, I want to, I want to start something. And, and usually at the start of something, you, you grow leaps and bounds. Like you said, mm -hmm. you're good at the, the, the zero percent up to 60, 70%, right? So mm -hmm. I think that that's why even you've said this to me, Ali, that, that you want, you feel like you, you don't want to master stuff. It's because you know where you're good. Mm. But, but to me, my argument to you was, but what if you truly like, mm. but again, you can still master being, being able to do things from zero to 60, 70%. Mm. Remember when we had that discussion is that yeah. you can still master that. Yeah. It's mastering the start. Yeah. It's mastering the start, but I'm also telling you there is beauty to mastering the finish. Mm. Yeah. That's definitely something I, that I love yeah. that you challenge us on. And that's what I, I, I'm glad we're doing something together now because you've helped me start something. I'm going to help you really take it to the nth degree now. Mm. Because while we're talking about doing this podcast, I've, I've taken a few notes and, and you know, I didn't mean to look down or anything, but to me, I'm taking notes on how structurally this can be better, how I can better take notes so that I can better refer to the book. And so to me, there's already ideas there brewing on refinement. Mm. And yeah. I think there's a lot of beauty to that. So, so look, when it comes to keynote speaking and how I got better at that, that was the real one way that I, I, I used is that I reviewed like a monster. And I did this not only with my keynotes, I did this with my workshops. You know, if people watched me and came to one of my communication workshops, they'll notice I've got four cameras continuously filming, one filming me, one filming the audience, one filming the audience when they're doing exercises. I film everything. And I film everything so I can watch it back on all screens simultaneously, right? And when I watch it back, Ali, I'm looking for when are people yawning? Yeah. When are people getting really tired and, and I can just see their body language going, oh my goodness, Vin, this is, it's gone too long without something engaging. So to me, there's beauty in mastery and that's what relates to this book because when you master something, you become hugely valuable to people. And you, when you become hugely valuable to people, say you're within an organization, they will grant any wish you desire because now you're hugely valuable. Mm -hmm. So, well, now leads us naturally to the point the, that the control trap. Do you remember this part of the book, the control trap? Yeah. So what that speaks to is that once you get really good at something within an organization, for example, sometimes those people around you don't want you to move now because you're too valuable at that, that thing now. So do you want to talk to that bit a, bit, a little bit? Yeah. Well, I think, I think you've given it the, the high level summary, but it becomes a natural thing as you progress in something. And again, it would be the same for you probably in the speaking space. I can't imagine what the conversations were like when you're like, Hey, I'm leaving the United States and I'm moving back to Australia because, yeah. uh, you're someone that's highly valuable. That's then choosing it. They use the example. I think it, it's off. Was it Lulu who was a software developer, really, really amazing software developer in a company at the start, a startup getting all these amazing offers, 
but mm. it pretty much goes through the process where every time one of those organizations tried to kind of lock her in, uh, mm. she was like, nah, you know, I'm out. And, and she kept essentially, I think the, the whole title of that chapter is saying no to job promotions and saying no to promotions because they do trap you in. I, I think back to the concept of like the golden handcuffs, which happens a lot in the corporate world where once you develop that capital, uh, the corporate world is essentially designed to lock you in with raises and bonuses and all these other um, incentives so that you do commit to that organization for a longer period of time. And yeah, that, that's kind of what I saw it as uh, in terms of the control trap. And, and to me, the thing that stands out is, well, at what point, because it's nearly, it's nearly again a contradiction, right? Because you're mastering something. So doesn't it make sense to completely lock in and continue that journey with that organization? Or should you, as you master something and you increase your value, should you protect your freedom and your autonomy and not really commit too much to one certain area? That's the thing that stood out to me. Well, well, also to that point, when you're mastering something, you have to ensure that you're continually on that journey. And I, and I think you, you've got to leave the job or the position when there's no room left for you to grow, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, and that, that's something I think a lot of organizations struggle to provide is they struggle to, and, and this is the problem with a lot of high performers that I've met and I've, I've got some of them in my family, right? Where they go, yeah, I've been in the job three years and I'm as far as I can go. Yeah. And then immediately from that point, you see the dissatisfaction start to build because I'm no longer mastering anything. I'm just kind of, I'm doing the same thing over and over and over and over again now. But that's also what an organization wants because that's how an organization kind of functions is that we get people really good in that role and then they stay there. And we just keep incentivizing. So they stay there. Right. But that's, that, that doesn't, that's not good for our mental health. That's not good for our headspace and that's not good for our own growth. Yeah. Well, well, it's, it's the tough thing to do in a fast growing or scaled organization because although those companies probably promote growth and that's, that's a big part of the story, I don't think a lot of them actually practice it in reality yeah, it's hard. Because, because say, for example, I grow to a certain area in my area, it might be marketing in, in this company. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, I've done really well in this. Can I then move ahead? and go into a different space. If you're mm. amazing at that one function, you're one of the best in the world at that function, that organization is going to probably want to keep you in that spot, regardless of your desires to then move on to communications or some area where you actually well, have to grow and go back to the beginner mindset. The organization doesn't want to support that, naturally speaking. But here's, but here's the thing. But if you got but if, I mean, but what if you got really, 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 really good. Mm-hmm. And then now they can't afford to lose you, but then you also want to do other stuff. They yeah. have to let you do it. Then you have to. Yeah. You, you get to negotiate. Then, yeah. You get to negotiate because again, you have more mm-hmm. career capital to be able to work with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. again, it goes back to the career capital again, that if you have enough career capital and you are so good that they can't ignore you and so good that they can't afford to lose mm-hmm. you as well then now you can, you can call the shots and you can yeah, continue sure. that career growth. You can continue that kind of fulfilling journey. Mm-hmm. Well, one way that I've seen it done really, really well in a lot of organizations, because as you do master a skill, especially when it's role-based or role-defined, mm. the reality is, is you're likely going to have a very significant level of impact without requiring the same level of input. Mm-hmm. So that for a lot of people is a way to then negotiate the growth areas of that potential role. Right. If you become amazing at negotiations and you can still hit that critical KPI relatively easy, whereas five years ago, getting those deals done would take you six months, whereas now you can turn them around in a month. I think then you've got a really good position to then go and negotiate with the capital that you're holding and and leverage becomes a pretty big thing, especially mm-hmm. I think in the working world and the job world, if we're taking it back to the book where then you can free up your flexibility and your time. It, it nearly goes full circle where you've then got the passion projects. Look, I think Google do it pretty well. I'm not sure if they still do it, yeah. but had 20% time where the majority of their workforce are obviously engineers and they're developing products and are optimizing products, but then they provided this space, 20% of your time where you can go and do essentially what you want, where, where I reckon that's a really cool way of embedding passion and growth. Uh, and a lot of those ideas... Uh, became things like Gmail and <laughs> so some of the 
they're better products over time, right? So, I don't know. Well, let me ask you this as we kind of sum this episode up, right? Mm. Someone comes to you and says, Ali, I don't feel happy in my job. Should I follow my passion? What would you say? Yeah, I say yes as a starting answer. So okay. even, even though it goes against the book, but then <laughs> but, I don't, I, but, but I don't finish it with that sentence. I don't mm-hmm. just say, yes, you should quit tomorrow and yeah. it'll all work itself out. Like I don't say it like that. I, I say yes, but, but let's, have a, let's have a think about this. So, and I start from a process of, all right, what is it that you don't currently like in, in your situation that's driven you to this point? Or what is it that's, that you're looking out there that you want to emulate? Because I think a lot of people that want to pursue passions, it's based on seeing someone or something that they care about, that they, it's a result that they essentially want to emulate, which also has its dangers. So it's breaking down that result and then going through the difficult process of mapping out what is the chances of this happening? And if I do go down this path from, a real life perspective, what does it then look like? So I'll then sit there with that person and be like, all right, you now have a passion of entering the golf industry. Brilliant. What is it that you're currently good at? Uh, What is something that people ask you for advice for? What are three to five skills that are amazing? Who are three to five people that you've seen out there that have done it well, that you're going to study and break down and emulate and get their path? And then what are some of those milestones that are going to show you that you're actually progressing in this place? And what is it that you're really risking by going down that path Mm. of pursuing this passion? And can you potentially do it while minimizing some of those risks? Right. So, so that would be my answer is yes, go for your passions and align what, what you do with who you are and use that as a, as a place for self-discovery and living a more fulfilled life. But make sure that you've got some really good backing and substance behind it. Or at least if you don't, that you've got a clear roadmap where you can see if you're progressing to that goal. But just don't go in wishing that it's going to pan out and don't, don't go, don't play from a position where you're sacrificing too much and the downward pressure of failure nearly hampers you pursuing your passion because passion isn't all that much fun when you've got other failures. Like if you can't pay your bills and your rent and all the, and look after your family and you're fighting with your spouse because you've gone and pursued your passion, you're not going to enjoy your passion. And passion is essentially love, right? Like people are looking to get closer towards doing something that they love. There's a lot of other conditions that need to be met because love sits there at the top of the pyramid, enjoyment and passion. Whereas I think that there is a process that you have to go through before being able to pursue that. I think that is great advice. No, I think that's, that's incredible advice. It's just extremely pragmatic. I, I would only add to that by saying that this book has really made me think, check that you don't love your current job. Just check. Hmm. Do the due diligence yeah. of checking that you don't actually love it because you may just not love it because you're not getting the three core factors that you can get from your job. And that may change how you feel about your job. You may yeah. only not like your job because you're not putting time towards deliberate practice and getting better at it. So you're not connected to your coworkers because you're not delivering the, the level of value that you should be delivering. Therefore, a disconnect in, in relationships with your boss and everyone, your customers, for example, you don't get autonomy because again, people don't view you as being competent. So before you jump ship and potentially fall victim to the chronic problem of changing jobs all the time and never achieving any sort of fulfillment, do the due due diligence and double check that you don't love it by setting aside time to engage in deliberate practice and mastery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me Me being very pragmatic, in terms of mastery of that standpoint, try mastering something. There's a world of value and fulfillment that lives after a level of mastery is achieved. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all I would add to what you said. I think you put it mm. so beautifully, man. I think, no, man. I, th- I, think, I think our advice now really is, uh, look, follow your passion, but but you really have to think about everything Ali just said and a little bit of what Vin said. And yeah. don't hoard toilet paper. Yeah. Well, leave room then, for me, Goreng. <laughs> leave, 
and and just uh, that that notion that you just hit on as well is really break down if you are unhappy with where you're currently at what is it that's making you unhappy because it might not be because you're not passionate about the job or the space it just might purely be because your boss is a prick um yeah. or you're having a fight with your colleague or you've got other pressures so that concept of what you just mentioned as well it just yeah i agree it sums it up perfectly around really dig deep into into what it is that you love and if you are going to pursue something um don't just walk into it blindly which uh that's that's the best thing in this book the mind yeah. is that uh yeah go in there with a bit of a plan for sure and look, I, I think a great a great quote that I'm going to use that I I love have loved all my life is look, I think if you become so good they can't ignore you from Steve Martin, if you be so good they can't ignore you, if you focus on that as your north star, you are leaving the control in your hands. When you blame the world, when you say oh you know damn COVID or damn this damn that, then then you're removing all of the control from yourself. Being so good, mastering something is something you do have control over, mm-hmm. something you can work on, something you can do. Yeah. So on, on that note, I just want to end with, and you can end with a quote too if you like, but I want to end on, be so good, they can't ignore you, my friends. I think it's great advice. That was, that was perfect, brother. That is the end point. Episode two. We did it, Ali. Yes. Hey, look at that. We'll, we'll continue the conversation off this, but um, hey, great job, brother. I, I'm really proud of you. I think you did. Uh, that, was, well. that was heaps of fun. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks for joining.